ask the clerk to take attendance for the purpose of a quorum. Senator Miller. Here. Senator Valverde. Here. Senator Lawson. Here. Senator Bell. Here. Senator Calkin. Senator DeMario. Here. Senator Golden. Senator Golden. Senator Paolino. Here. We have a quorum, so we will start because we have uh, a few other senators here interested in introducing their legislation. So we'll go through that first, and just so everybody has some idea of how we might move forward, I think we'll go first to the um, House bill that's posted, um, seeing as it's been brought over as having passed um, um, in the House, uh, we'll, we'll, have the, we'll go through that bill first after we get presentations from the senators, and then we'll um, do the rest of our calendar. Um, so I believe the first person on our calendar who is here to present their bill uh, would be Senator Anderson on Senate Bill 488. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. Um, yes, Bill 488 authorizes a pharmacist to prescribe and dispense hormonal contraceptive patches and self-administered oral hormonal contraceptives, provided the pharmacist has completed a training program approved by the State Board of Pharmacy. Um, Over-the-counter contraceptives are among the safest and most well-researched reproductive health, health options available to people and the Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, after extensive research, made the recommendation that over-the-counter contraceptives prescribed and provided by pharmacists would be a best practice and recommended it be implemented. That actually was in 2012. And um, since then, since 2013, 14 states and DC have implemented um, legi legislation to make that possible. Um, and pharmacists are some of the most underutilized and accessible health care providers working at convenient location with extended hours operation, of operation um, that physicians typically lack. Um, the reason I decided to um, sponsor this companion bill from the House was that pharmacists prescribed contraception increases access to care. It's actually an equity issue. Um, it can be difficult for vulnerable or at-risk populations to easily access primary care. As we know, there are many people uninsured. For patients who don't have primary care or can't easily get to a doctor's office, this legislation would allow advanced care pharmacists with specialty training to prescribe birth control to um, reduce unintended preg pregnancies. As you saw in your packet, um, Dr. Uh, Nicole Alexander Scott did, um, she is supporting this legislation and she um, provided some data. Some of the data that I thought was important was that uh, according to the Rhode Island Pregnancy Risk Assessment and Monitoring System, um, it shows that 35.8% of pregnancies are unplanned. Um, we're lucky. That's below the national average, which is closer to 50. But it's still too many. And there are a lot of subgroups of women or people who are capable of getting pregnant um, like 61 or 60.1% were under the age of 25. 55.4% were on Medicaid prior to the pregnancy. 48.9% of Black and 47.1% Latinx people reported that their pregnancies were unplanned. So that this is more of a at-risk or vulnerable populations need access to birth control. 
Um, these pregnancies were also associated with higher rates of premature birth and low birth weight, requiring more health services down the road, and often um, really compromising people economically. Uh, as there's an example in Oregon of uh, when they implemented this in 2016, they saw their Medicare expenditures drop by avoiding the high cost or the cost involved with unintended preg pregnancies. In short, pharmacists are the best trained on the nuances between different birth control options and can best address side effects. And studies find that pharmacist involvement in patient care improves outcomes, increases adherence, and decreases cost while increasing access for all women or people who are capable of getting pregnant. There will be par pharmacists on here who will testify and can answer any kind of technical questions. Thank you. I just have one question before we go to the rest of the committee. Have you encountered in being involved in this legislation when there are any uh, reimbursement issues based on the prescription to a pharmacist rather than through the physician? I don't, I can't speak to that. Um, I, I'm new to this concept and yeah. researched yeah. it more on, on other grounds, but probably the pharmacist could address that. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions from the committee to the sponsor? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to skip over um, from the committee members who have in, uh, legislation that they would wish to introduce to those who are um, not committee members and might have to go to other hearings. So that means I prefer to skip down to Senator Coyne on Senate Bill 489 to present. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate uh, you taking me now. Uh, I do have another committee uh, this afternoon. Um, this one, 489, uh, is pretty simple. This act would establish a process for the donation of unused medications for the use by nonprofit state and local facilities by owners of animals. Um, every day, veterinary hospitals and clinics receive previously dispensed medications from their clients whose pets no longer require them. Sometimes these are medications from a recently deceased pet, whereas other times, they are medications no longer needed to treat a particular animal. Most of the time, these medications are perfectly usable for other animals, and current Rhode Island law requires these medications to be discarded and does not allow these medications to be donated for the use in shelters, ponds, pounds, and low-cost clinics that serve the poor. Some hospitals mail these medications out of country to rescue organizations that serve needy pet owners abroad. A few states, including Nevada, have passed legislation that allows these medications to be donated to nonprofit organizations, uh, shelters and rescue groups that serve low-income pet owners. Allowing this donation would result in many thousands of dollars in supplies being made available to help those less fortunate who are trying to provide care for their sick and injured pets. Um, and with that, uh, committee members and Mr. Chairman, uh, there will be members of the Veterinary Association that are going to be testifying uh, later on this afternoon. Any questions for Chair Coyne on the committee? Thank you for- Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Taking the time to present. Thank you. I don't think Senator Gallo is with us. So, if we want to go back to Senator Lawson on 490 to present on that bill. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon. Same to my colleagues. This bill would authorize pharmacists to prescribe drugs and devices under certain circumstances that would be uh, regulated by the Department of Health. They may do so, pharmacists may do so uh, under the following conditions that a condition doesn't require a new di diagnosis is a minor one. And if uh, the professional judgment of a pharmacist 
is there is immediate dispensing of a drug necessary for an individual to avoid harm. The pharmacist may prescribe it in amount necessary to address that condition until a patient is able to um, see another care professional. And I know there are some uh, letters in the packet in regards to um, some of the issues as well. Thank you. Any questions for Senator Lawson on this bill from the committee? Thank you. Uh, we can move on to Senator Valverde's 589. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 589 is having to do with um, pharmacies as well. Um, it authorizes a pharmacist who successfully completes a course on tobacco cessation therapy to prescribe and dispense tobacco cessation drug products. Um, so we all know the, um, the negative health effects of smoking and um, quitting is the best way to avoid those negative health effects. So when people want to quit smoking, um, you know, timing is key. We want to meet people where they are and pharmacists have that ability um, because many pharmacists are available, um, you know, 24 seven um, in people's own neighborhoods. Um, the, um, you know, added benefits of allowing pharmacists to prescribe uh, tobacco cessation therapy drugs is that um, you know, the cost of um, over-the-counter products is often a barrier to people quitting smoking. And so if a pharmacist can prescribe drugs, then they can more often be covered by insurance. Um, this bill is consistent with um, guidance um, put out by uh, CMS and there's also a letter of support from the Department of Health. Any questions for Senator Valverde on this bill? If not, we can move on to your 879. All right. Okay, again, having to deal with uh, uh, pharmacies, um, 879 would amend the definition of the practice of pharmacy to include the administration of medications. Um, so this bill is aimed at increasing adult patients' access to medications. Um, there are many uh, medications that are now available that can be long-acting um, injectables. Um, Medication-based treatment for substance use disorder um, is one example where pharmacists could be very helpful um, with increasing access to care, um, as well as um, newer, uh, longer-acting antipsychotic drugs that could be administered by pharmacists. Um, this bill is also supported by the Department of Health, and um, I think that's it. Is, does it have a specific list of drugs that would be administered, or is it just generally? Oh, I believe that would be determined by the Department, Department of, Health. of Health. What yeah. drugs would qualify for this yeah. program? Yeah, okay. but the um, pharmacists who are calling in could speak to that okay. more. Any other questions from members of the committee on this bill? Thank you. We had Senator Coyne already, Senator Gallo's bill, um, there are a few people calling in on that bill um, uh, would require that any payment be made by an enrollee on or behalf of an enrollee by another person towards an enrollee's applicable cost sharing requirement is applied in full to the enrollee's out-of-pocket cost deductible cost sharing or similar obligations. There will be people later on in the hearing um, testifying on that. and. Um, so then we have uh, Senate Bill 830, also by Senator, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Senate Bill 877 by Senator DiMario. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, so this act would prohibit insurance carriers from charging any out-of-pocket expenses to the insured for treatment related to the COVID-19 pandemic while the state of um, emergency order is in effect. And in addition, it would further mandate that all COVID-19 testing and vaccination are free both during and upon the expiration of the state of emergency order. Um, so 
We know that out-of-pocket expenses inhibit people from accessing care. There have been multiple studies done on this, um, and this exists across the economic spectrum. And um, what we saw uh, last month um, was that when one insurance company signaled that they might resume cost sharing for COVID-19 treatment, um, you know, first of all, there's a lot of pushback against that, and, and they did they did reverse course. But what happened is that even when that signal happened, there was a lot of confusion um, in the public about you know, questioning related to testing costs. It may have led to some testing hesitation. Um, and so what we're looking to do with this bill is while the state of emergency is in effect, we want to make sure um, that we are, are removing as many barriers as possible from people accessing testing services, certainly vaccination. <clears throat> Excuse me, the pollen is terrible today. Um, and, you know, and also treatment. Um, so one of the you know, unique features that we've seen in this pandemic is that from a public health perspective, um, you know, we really need to continue to have a collective response um, and not just an individual one in, in terms of the, the health of our communities. And so, again, just making sure that there are not barriers um, to people being able to access those tools of, of testing to, to know and potentially stop a further outbreak from happening. Um, and also vaccination will help to keep us all healthy. Um, so, and also I just wanna to speak to the provision that both testing and vaccination will uh, remain free from cost sharing after the state of emergency is over. Um, and, and that's really just for the same reason. Um, you know, we are hearing a lot about variants that may be developing. We want to be able to prevent further outbreaks before they happen. And further, we still have large categories of our population, namely younger children who have not been vaccinated yet. And it is, likely that we might reach a point where the state of emergency could be over um, before many of our children are eligible to be vaccinated. And so by making that provision that there would not be cost sharing um, you know, for, uh, for vaccinations at, after that point, it would be a really compo important component to making sure that all segments of our population are able to be vaccinated when they can. Um, there is um, a letter in support both from the governor's office and also from the Office of the Health Insurance Commissioner, although I think that I saw that there was a, a proposed wording amendment that I would want to take a closer look at. Um, but I would be happy um, to answer any questions about this. Um, and I also um, you know, do just want to give a lot of credit to uh, Representative Morales, who, who did a lot of work on, um, on responding to that issue that happened last month and, and coming up with this idea. So um, I'm really happy to, to bring this bill to, to the committee today. Thank you. You said there's a language change that's um, proposed by uh, by the Office of the Health Insurance Commissioner. I just I, lo okay. I looked at it briefly and it looked like it was a, a, a switch from a uh, from a shall to a may okay. um, in one of the sections. And I believe it ha just had to do with um, the the short uh, the potentially short range of time that the state of emergency might persist. And so I, I wanted to take a closer look at that and I'd be happy to um, hear any any feedback um, about that, either from the committee or um, you know, if there were any uh, legal notes on that as well. Any questions from the committee for Senator Mario on this bill? Do we have any um, indication from the governor's office on executive order covers this currently on when executive order might be phased out on this? So how urgent this might be? Yeah, I wouldn't really presume to, to guess that. I don't have any particular information about that. Um, I think, you know, again, the um, the concern is that, you know, one, we're only in session until the end of June. Uh, I would guess that the state of emergency would, would persist uh, after that, you know, so there could still be a, a period of time where that would lapse and, you know, we wouldn't be able to, to react if, if there were a change to happen. Um, and also, I think that, you know, just again, from a public health messaging perspective, I think it's really important to be able to send that very consistent message that there will not be out-of-pocket costs for these things. Um, because again, even just the, the mention of that last month had a, a confusing and, and, and potentially chilling effect on, on people um, pursuing that, that testing that they may have needed. It seems like executive order will give us time to have further review of the legislation. And, but um, in the meantime, it's really a public perception issue 
um, rather than a legal issue based on executive order, as I understand it. I agree, and I do. I do think that you know um, there there is time just to to make sure that again the wording is right. Okay. Um, but it is something that I, you know I would be interested in in getting right and making sure we get back to the committee okay. this session. Thank you. That was my concern. Yeah. Yeah. It, it looks like Senator Bell has a question. I think. Senator Bell. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator DiMario, for uh, this legislation. I think this is incredibly important, and I also think it's very time sensitive. You know, I, I strongly agree with you that we do not know that the state of emergency will be renewed until the, uh, the next legislative session, and certainly not until the point in the next legislative session where we might be able to pass the bill, because it does take some time to get that process started at the beginning of the year. So I am concerned that if this doesn't pass, we could reach a situation where we might start uh, having co-pays for COVID-19 vaccinations, would be, which would be extraordinarily detrimental towards our public health goals. Um, I uh, reviewed the Health Insurance Commissioner's letter, and I have to say I strenuously object to the suggestion that the Health Insurance Commissioner makes, which appears to be to change uh, the regulatory direction given to the health insurance commissioner from simply promulgating rules and regulations to enforce compliance by insurance companies towards extremely broad regulatory language, which would allow the health insurance commissioner to implement regulations that would be contrary to the intent of the legislation. I think it is a completely unreasonable suggestion and not one that we should entertain or delay this legislation for. So I just wanted to share that, um, you know, I, I, you know, I know that we always like to, to wait and, and look at feedback, but I'm very concerned about this particular suggestion. And quite frankly, I think it is, um, I, I do not think it's an appropriate request uh, for the health insurance uh, commissioner to be making. I'm not sure that's the only interpretation of the letter, but we will review it. Um, we know that the executive order is going to be in place because it's already been renewed, and I, won't, I haven't looked at the renewal date, but um, I think we have at least 30 days on this at a minimum, and I'm sure that this wouldn't be, um, you know, they're, they're individually, nobody is suggesting right now that his powers be um, eliminated to being able to file executive orders. Um, so I think this is the kind of thing that we have at least 30 days on rather than um, concern either today or looking at the legislation before the hearing, was this something that we had to um, think about immediately? I think we have enough time to look at whether there's other interpretations of the OHICS input uh, or um, or other changes that would make it um, specific to the request of the legislation. So I think we have time to do that um, versus what could be interpreted as urgent. I think what's urgent is people outside of the legislation understand that there is an executive order which pro prohibits the addition of co-pays or deductibles and people should understand that. And I think it was neighborhood that, uh, um, you know, tried to preempt it versus the executive order and they rescinded it as quick as they understood that that wasn't possible under the executive order. Um, so I think going forward, um, we do have the time to make sure to get it right and to make sure those who can will clarify that there is no copay or deductible currently based on executive order. Are there any other questions on this bill before um, we finish with uh, Senate inter introductions by having uh, Senator Valverde um, go through and present uh, Senate Bill 830? Senator Valverde. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, Senate Bill 830 
would prohibit the Board of Med Medical Licensure and Discipline from requiring specialty board certification as a condition of licensure. It would also provide that a healthcare insurer would not deny reimbursement or provide lower reimbursement rates to a physician or a hospital based on a physician's decision whether or not to participate in a national continued board certification program. So we've gotten a lot of testimony on this, um, this bill, a lot of written testimony, and um, a lot of physicians um, who are saying that um, the maintenance of certification requirement um, that is overseen by a large corporation is, um, does not have um, a lot of relevancy um, to um, continuing education, you know, what they do in their daily practices, and that these exams cost a lot of money and take a lot of time, but don't actually provide um, the benefit that they claim to. Um, so I look forward to hearing testimony from the people who are going to call in today. Any questions for the sponsor before we go to calls? I think that's the last bill we need presented. If not, I wanted to um, go to the calls and I want to start with, um, like I said before we got underway, um, to go to the House Bill first, uh, which is uh, House Bill 5012 Sub AA um, by Representative Slater. Um, as everybody knows, this is the Nursing Home Staffing and Quality Care Act that we uh, passed the Senate version um, a few weeks ago. And um, so we want to take those calls first. Um, and the first call on that bill would be uh, Bill Flynn from the Senior Agenda Coalition. Mr. Hello. Flynn? Mr. Flynn? Uh, yes, Chairman. Go right ahead. You're on with the committee. Thank you very much, Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I realize that you've passed this, uh, the, an unamended version of this bill already. I'll be, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, we think it's really, this is a reasonable compromise that maintains the essential provisions of the original bill. Well, it does respond to some of the concerns uh, that the nursing home industry uh, raised about the initial bill. I'd like to just hit two quick points. Uh, we've heard some refer to this as an unfunded mandate. Um, we think that's not accurate. Uh, there, is, there is language in the bill that does guarantee cost of living adjustments and rate increases over three years. Uh, but in addition, uh, this is, in our view, a public health and safety mandate. <clears throat> and I would compare the situation, it has many similarities to after the station nightclub fire, where over 100 died, and after analysis of causes of that, um, there was a, a mandate in terms of uh, crowds in, in places and also a mandate requiring uh, sprinkler systems in some venues. And uh, so we've had a pandemic where over 1,500 people have died in nursing homes. And so we think that this really is a, is a safety and public health mandate that's needed. But the second thing, a quick story, uh, several years ago I had the chance to spend extensive time while volunteering at a table with a CNA who had worked over 10 years in the industry and she was recuperating from back injury, but, and she told me a lot about her job and how much she loved working in a nursing home because you had long-term relationships with patients. She had worked at several nursing homes and uh, that were considered good ones, but she said to me that even the very best, the biggest complaint and her biggest complaint was not salary, but understaffing. And she said, uh, she mentioned, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but she said, you know, if you're on the weekend shift and now you have to care for 20 people instead of 10 because of un not enough staffing or not coverage, if someone calls in, she said it's not just bad for the patients, it's stressful for the workers. And, and so I believe that, the you know, 
issues with coverage is a factor uh, in terms of there not being, you know, a sufficient supply of CNAs. And one of the things and the stresses that drive people out of uh, doing this kind of work. So just wanted to have you be aware of, I think, those two ways of looking at why this is important. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Flynn from the committee? If not, I would like to thank you for calling in. Uh, you're welcome, Mr. Chairman and members. Yeah. I know you've got a big uh, agenda. Thank you for taking me early. You're welcome. Okay. Mr. Falk, I believe you're the next call we're going to hear from on. Uh... Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Miller, uh, Emanuel Falk, uh, District 1199, SEIU, New England. Um, you've been before this committee a few times on this on the Nursing Home Safe Staffing and Quality Care Act. Uh, I want to thank the, the Senate Whip, Mary Ellen Goodwin, for uh, leading on the, the leading the charge on uh, improving staffing and quality for nursing home residents with this with similar legislation for two sessions. And um, I want to thank the committee for passing a, a stronger version in um, earlier this year in January um, and for pass the Senate for passing it on the floor. Uh, the, current, the current bill before you is um, tremendous progress from where we are um, currently and before the campaign started. Um, Rhode Island had the worst level of staffing in our nursing homes in New England and 41st worst in the country. Um, the ch change bill before you today would make Rhode Island a leader in New England in 2022 and a national leader over the next two and a half years in quality staffing. Um, and I just want to echo a couple of things I said back in January in the committee. Um, the academic consensus is in. Um, COVID infection rates went up in general, where there was less staffing. I want to read a quote from Charlene Harrington, who's considered one of the leading experts on nursing home uh, policy in the country. Uh, in reference to the nursing home, she, she wrote, they were allowed to not have enough staffing and they were allowed to ignore infection control deficiency. So they had poorer quality than the public knew about. And they were in the in worse position to manage COVID. That is the leading expert weighing in as a direct quote from an investigative report that was in the New York Times. So um, this is a good, strong bill. Not only does it get um, us on a path to safer staffing levels, but it also puts frontline caregivers on a path to a living wage. Um, it's time for some accountability um, with the nursing home industry. What we've learned in the pandemic is the status quo is not acceptable. And frankly, low pay, low staffing has not been acceptable for decades. So I uh, urge the committee to once again pass this and send it to the floor of the Senate. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. So, Mr. Falk, I know that you probably, um, more than most people who are calling in or have been involved in this legislation other than the sponsors, are right. probably uh, um, more familiar with it and therefore um, better to explain to the committee on the differences between the Senate version and the House version. Can you go through some of those? Yeah, I can go through some of the top lines on that. So yeah. the, uh, again, we started at, we have zero hours as a standard right now. Um, we just don't have a standard. So um, the original bill uh, was 4.1, which is the CMS guideline. Um, uh, as the industry pointed out, there had not been a state that had reached 4.1 yet. Um, so we took what, you know, we looked at, um, you know, what other leading states did um, throughout the process. But what the legislation does is it moves Rhode Island to a 3.58 standard. Um, in six, in, in basically, it would move Rhode Island to a 3.58 standard in about six months. That is the standard uh, Massachusetts implemented in um, January. Um, so that would bring us in line. There's, a, you know, there's some apples and oranges there, but basically it would bring us in line with uh, you know, as having 
the highest standard with mass or one of the highest standards in New England from the, you know, the worst that we have right now. Um, and then uh, the following year, we would move to 3.81, um, which would uh, make us one of the, the national uh, Maybe there, there was actually a good point made by some of the physical therapist groups. Um, and, you know, they mentioned that physical therapy, occupational therapy, you know, really was hands-on care and should be counted as direct care. So those categories are included um, towards the uh, standard. Um, physical therapy, as, f- physical therapy and? Yes, phys- licensed physical therapists. Um, and physical therapist assistants, as well as licensed occupational therapists uh, were added. Um, So that helps out the nursing homes that do um, a lot of rehab. Um, And I thought it was a good point that that person from uh, that ran a physical therapy company uh, made during the uh, Senate hearing. Um, And it also includes um, uh, speech, licensed speech pathologists. So, um, those are so that's kind of the big changes on the staffing front. On the um, bill, uh, Flynn from Senior Agenda kind of hit the the other big point. Um, there's some uh, there's a three year incremental base rate increase um, um, that that is included, and um, there's a little more flexibility um, in uh, some of the fines. Um, but the core fine structure stayed in place. Um, but for example. Um, Department of Health now has the option on a, after three consecutive quarters of violations, Department of Health um, can either end reimbursement um, to the nursing home, end Medicaid reimbursement until they come into line. Um, and then what this, the new version has, it gives Department of Health an additional option, uh, an or option to um, stop admissions um, into the nursing home until they come in line with the standard. Um, I'd like to point out that basically two thirds of the nursing homes, according to CMS data, are already at um, the 2022 standard, um, and about 20% are right, right there, practically there. Um, and there's about eight or ten nursing homes that, you know, frankly, they need to they need to improve and and have better staffing. And as as the accountability mechanism. Um, it's the state government's job to make sure Medicaid um, dollars are, are being spent for quality care. So those are the, those are the primary um, changes in the bill, Chairman. So um, you compared the, the 3.58 rate um, staffing ratio is the same as Massachusetts? Yeah, that they implemented in January of yeah. this year. So I know the issue came up, and maybe you can explain it, or I can get somebody else who's calling in to explain it, or we can get it Mm -hmm. um, from the Senate sponsor, is um, our reimbursement rate, and we have uh, three years of base rate increases, our Mm -hmm. reimbursement rate versus Massachusetts reimbursement rate, how different are those? um, It's hard to compare exactly, but they're pretty... They're pretty comparable. What I would what I would add is, um, and in the governor's budget, it is also a significant um, uh, nursing home inflationary index increase um, that you know has a good chance of staying in the budget. Um, you couple that with the base rate increase, and basically the increases would be um, comparable, if not a little more proportionately than the the mass increases that just went into effect. I would like to point out that the mass increase um, was really targeted towards acuity and uh, facilities with high Medicaid census. So um, our, these base rate increases and the nursing home inflationary index really would represent uh, a little more flexibility on how uh, nursing home owners could spend the money. I'm sure they would disagree with that assertion, but um, we believe that to be true. Um, Chairman, I, I was remiss. I forgot one other significant change um, is uh, the implementation date. Um, basically, the standard would go into effect in January 2022. Um, the original legislation had, um, you know, July of this year, um, which would have been a, a, a quick turnaround time. But uh, we we really appreciate this committee, uh, the WHIP, and the Senate for passing um, the original bill, which was. 
um, very strong and had the 4.1. But um, this is a this is a very strong bill, and like I said, it would be uh, make us a national leader in about two and a half, three years. Senator Bell has a question for you. Yeah, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Falk, and, and thank you, Chairman. I, I, I echo the Chairman's comments about the importance of the reimbursement rate. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, you know, while I, I think that we need to move forwards with the compromise as presented to us uh, for practical reasons, and I, I hope we voted out today, um, I, I was concerned to see the reimbursement uh, rate. Um, I, I, I was concerned to see us go uh, below 4.1. It's true it was an ambitious goal, but I think it was ambitious uh, for good reasons. And we do need a high quality of care. And uh, I think 4.1 is the CMS standard for a reason. And so I, I thought it would have made more sense for us to have provided additional funding particularly because we're in an unusually good budget year right now. And because, you know, due to the federal rules with the Medicaid shift, we can, in fact, effectively provide the funding at no net cost to the state. It seemed to me uh, unfortunate that we had to water down the staffing requirements rather than appeasing the nursing homeowners by providing additional federal funds. So, you know, I, I certainly uh, think that we should you know, move forwards with this. And I guess the question I have for you is, just to clarify, SEIU's position is that we should move forwards with this compromise as soon as possible and vote it out today. If that's the case, I think we should do it. But I just want to clarify, that's what you'd like us to do, right? Let me let me answer that question. Just say we, we support um, the this version of the bill. Um, and, you know, it's not up to, to me to say when it gets voted out. <laughs> Sure, but okay, or my, but or my like organization. But yes, we are like like I said during my testimony, Senator Bell. We we, we support okay. this. This would make us uh, a national leader, and uh, our members, all frontline caregivers for years, people that have been in nursing homes, most nursing homes, or many nursing homes. You know, they they need better staffing. People have been clamoring for this for years. Um, we are facing, you know, a mental health crisis with the workforce. Uh, they've been through a lot, a lot of trauma, not just here in Rhode Island, but we did, of course, have higher death rates. We were an outlier for that, um, in part because of staffing. So this is a strong bill. It is a policy that we need to have some accountability, but frankly, to improve the lives of thousands of uh, frontline caregivers and residents yeah. and their families. So we, we fully support it. And um, again, are asking the committee to, you know, pass this version of the legislation uh, again. Great. I think we should pass this and continue working on the reimbursement rates as well. So thank you so much for all the work you've done. One other question I'd like to ask you about this bill is um, uh, there's been a lot of conversation around whether there are enough people to fill um, the vacancies that this would create in staffing. Do you do you anticipate that there's enough people in the workforce who will be interested in these positions? I, you know, I, I do. Obviously, there's, there's, there's work to do. I, Chairman, you, I believe you asked me this question last time. And, and as I pointed out, in 2019, um, basically 30% of the CNA workforce either didn't start work or dropped out um, um, shortly after doing the work. So there's enough people getting licensed to do it. We need to have better work conditions. I think the staffing um, goes goes a long way, um, especially with you know younger CNAs that you know come in and take care of fifteen or sixteen person on a sh on a shift. They're not going to stick around for uh, a job, or that frankly they have too much work to do and are not able to complete their job. So I think um, I use the analogy of a, of a school. You know, you can give. It's not just about raises. You can give teachers are raised, but if you move their class size from 25 to 40, um, you're going to have retention and attraction problems. So um, this bill will go towards the, the biggest issue from our survey for members, which was it's just not a reasonable workload when you're taking care of 15 or 16 um, residents on a shift. That's not acceptable. Um, so I, I, you know, I think more people will stay in the work. I think more of the people that go through the trouble of getting licensed will, will see a drop off in that 30%. And then, of course, the bill has a, a wage uh, increase um, and gets folks to on a path of 
path to a living wage, which is obviously important, is also very important um, to uh, retaining and attracting people. I mentioned the staffing first because um, wages obviously are super important to attracting a workforce, but sometimes, you know, work conditions, um, we forget how important those are. And people need dignity and respect at the work. And at the end of the day, after doing the really hard work that it is to be a CNA in a nursing home, people want to feel like they accomplished their job. And I think there will be more sense of that accomplishment at the end of each shift um, once workers begin to have a more reasonable uh, workload. So sorry for a really long answer. The short answer is yes. I think there's, 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 there's enough and there will be enough people to um, fulfill the new standard. Any other questions for Mr. Falk? Thank you for calling in. Thank you. I believe the next caller we're going to try to connect is uh, Scott Frazier. Mr. Frazier. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Scott Fraser, President and CEO of the Rhode Island Healthcare Association. We represent 63 of the nursing homes in the state of Rhode Island. Um, although amendments have been made to the original bill, this is still an unfunded mandate. There has been some money included in the legislation, approximately $12 million over the life of the bill, over the two or three years of the bill. But the estimates from the accounting firm of Clifton Larson Allen show that there will be a cost to nursing homes in Rhode Island of between 40 and $45 million. Again, by the time we hit 3.8 hours, that will not be covered by this funding. And uh, to answer your question, Mr. Chairman, uh, in Massachusetts, when they went to 3.58, earlier this year, the Massachusetts legislature provided $90 million in funding um, this year alone. And the financial liability comes at a time when nursing homes in Rhode Island are dealing with long-term underfunding of the Medicaid program, this year alone, our homes are underfunded by approximately $50 million. Nursing homes are dealing with the additional costs due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And Mr. Chairman, in response to your earlier question, even if this bill were to be fully funded, the number of people needed to meet the arbitrary staffing mandate just simply don't exist. The American Healthcare Association estimates that to meet the 3.8 hours of minimum staffing, more than 800 employees would need to be hired. And we just don't know where those workers are going to come from. But moving forward, the Rhode Island Healthcare Association remains ready to work with you, the Senate, the House, and the governor in order to advocate for, as you have said, and some of your committee members have already said in this hearing, for additional funding, which will be needed to keep our homes in operation, serving our members and serving our residents, and to address any other problems that will be created by this legislation. So, Mr. Frazier, you mentioned uh, 90 million in Massachusetts towards this initiative versus the 12 million number. Um, can you do some of the math, or have you done some of the math on how many patients or facilities in Massachusetts, which has a population of about 6 million versus Rhode Island at 1 million, um, how that does that 12 million fill the gap based on um, demographics no. versus the 90 million? It, no, it doesn't. And the 12 million is over the cost course of several years. It's, I believe, one to two million in the first year and then two, uh, two million or so in the next year. It's, it's over the course of a three year, a three year period, which equals the 12 million, which is not comparable to the $90 million, which was the one time payment um, in February of this year when Massachusetts put their legislation into effect. Thank you. Any um, questions from the committee for Mr. Frazier? If not, I want to thank you for calling in and we'll move to the next caller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Uh, next, I believe we have Marjorie Waters. Ms. Waters? Yes. Go right ahead, you're on with the committee. Hi, my name is Marjorie Waters, and I'm with Rhode Island Organizing Project. I am in support 
a bill 50012 sub A. And I'd like to just give you a personal reason why I think there's such a conundrum when it comes to nursing home and retaining CNAs. My son's young partner, who is the mother of two toddlers, was very excited to begin training for CNA. She completed her courses and was issued a temporary license and began begin her job. She began right after the first of the year in January. She lasted three months. The main issue was staffing. As a brand new CNA, she nightly had 13 to 15 patients to care for. Her shift from 3 to 11 required feeding and preparing people for bed, washing, brushing teeth, hair, and such. As a new CNA, it was an impossible task. During the three months, she contracted COVID, which through her amazing diligence, she did not pass on to my two toddler grandsons. She um, was involved with a violent episode with a patient, which she was trying to prevent the patient from harming themselves. No other staffing on the floor. She received scratches on her arms. When she finally left, when she had to, by herself, get a woman up off the floor, a patient had fallen, and by herself, she had to get that woman back in bed. As a result, she injured her back. She looked forward to doing this. She cared for her grandparents. This is something she really wanted to do but she felt that she wasn't making a difference for the patients and being injured and stressed out was affecting her family life. So unfortunately, she had to leave. Once again, her major issue was not pay, although she wished she was paid more, but it was the number of patients per shift. You know, I know that she would come back into the industry if the patient to CNA ratio improved. I'm hoping that this bill helps accomplish that. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions for Ms. Waters from the committee? If not, I want to thank you for calling in on this bill and all the work you've done on behalf of it. Thank you. The next call we're going to try to connect with on this bill is uh, John Wesley from the Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Mr. Wesley? Hi, thanks. Thanks, Chairman Miller. Um, my name is John Wesley and I am the Director of Policy at the Rhode Island Coalition Against Domestic Violence. We are here today in strong support for uh, House Bill 5012, the sub A that's in front of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee today, the Nursing Home Staff and Quality Care Act. Um, our membership of, of local domestic violence shelters and our task force of domestic violence survivors, SOAR, is in strong support of this legislation. Um, we believe that direct care workers, such as essential employees in nursing homes, uh, are unfortunately currently underpaid and understaffed, and the COVID-19 pandemic has only made this staffing crisis worse. As we know, almost all of the direct care workers are women, and the majority of these are women of color who are disproportionately harmed by domestic violence and intimate partner violence as well. These caregivers deserve increased wages and a minimum staffing standard for Rhode Island. Uh, such critical supports such as these would help create economic, gender, and racial equity in Rhode Island and further prevent abuse and violence in our communities as well. Um, we know that lack of financial stability is a prominent reason that victims are unable to leave an abusive relationship um, and become financially independent. We also know that poverty and income inequality are root causes of domestic violence in our communities. 
So no victim of domestic violence should remain at risk because of a lack of quality employment opportunities here in Rhode Island with liberal wages and fair labor standards, especially in essential worker positions such as these in nursing homes to care for our most vulnerable elder population during a global pandemic. So lastly, we believe Rhode Island can be a state where our elder residents are, are given high quality, the highest quality services possible in our nursing homes by essential care workers who are compensated fairly for their life-saving work and treated like the frontline heroes that they are. So we strongly urge the committee to support the sub-A bill from the House and really appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions for John? If not, um, I did inquire um, further about um, my question to Mr. Frazier about the 90 million versus the 12 million. And um, some of the feedback I got from asking about that is that um, there is an inflationary index and without that inflationary index removed, which there is no in anticipation on that, that um, our, our contribution towards the 90 million versus the 12 million that Rhode Island has is comparable with that inflationary index in place. So just um, some more information to be considered based on the compromise language that we have in front of us. I think we have one more caller um, on the uh, House bill, Mr. Uh, Rabbi Jeffrey Goldwasser. who uh, currently isn't answering um, or picking up on that. So I believe um, that's everybody who wanted to call in on the House version. Um, is there a motion on this? Senator Valverde? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I move passage of House Bill 5012 sub A. Is there a second? Second. From Senator DeMario, Senator Bell. Um, will the clerk please take a roll on House 5012 sub AA for passage? Senator Miller. Yes. Senator Valverde. Yes. Senator Lawson. Yes. Senator Bell. Yes. Senator Calkin. Senator DeMario. Yes. Senator Golden. Yes. Senator Paolino. Yes. So that bill has seven positive votes. Uh, we'll move that, we'll recommend that be moved to the floor. Thank you for everybody who called in on that legislation and the work that went into the, um, the bill that we just passed. So next I would like to go to calls um, on the rest of our calendar and I'll go by bill number. Um, I think that's most appropriate considering the bills today. The first bill that we would hear based on that would be um, Senate Bill 488, uh, Jeffrey Bratberg from URI Pharmacy. Mr. Bratberg? Yes, hello, thank you. And you can- Chair Miller. You can testify, instead of us calling you back three times, you can testify in the three bills that you've signed up for, if you wish. Okay, that sounds great. Okay. So I'm testifying in support of uh, Bill S-488, uh, which is on pharmacist provider oral contraceptives. Uh, I'd like to provide my individual strong support for this. 
I appreciated the uh, Senator Anderson's introduction. Not much to add there. I think the important thing is that two out of three women surveyed are interested in having pharmacists prescribe hormonal contraception, uh, particularly women among the groups who had difficulty getting a prescription, which a year ago you would remember that pharmacies were all open as essential providers, but primary care and other uh, prescriber offices were closed at this time due to COVID, which is sort of a a recent example of how important access to pharmacies and pharmacists with these skills is. Um, There's no need to wait for a doctor's appointment to get a prescription for oral contraceptives or a refill when it can be obtained directly from a pharmacist. Um, So that's for Bill uh, 488. Should I just keep going on the other bills? Yes, you can. Um, Let me see. Okay. Anybody has any questions uh, based on... 488 before he moves on to the next bill, 490. Any questions? Go right ahead. Okay. So for uh, bill number uh, 490, which is to give pharmacists the authority to prescribe drugs and devices under uh, protocols established by the Rhode Island Department of Health. Again, I think it's pharmacists are accessible. It's really important that um, we work together with our provider colleagues to, and the public health uh, authorities and, and uh, departments to have pharmacists have protocols and training in place uh, to be able in emergencies like we've been in or currently are in uh, to prescribe uh, or, or furnish medications um, for emergencies to furnish refills. This is successfully done in several other states to prescribe, uh, prescribe or furnish drugs for first aid or self-limiting conditions. Again, pharmacists are not diagnosing, um, and I think that there's a wide range of particularly public health um, medications and conditions that pharmacists are already trained uh, to furnish medications or prescribe medications for, and so I have full support of Senate Bill 490. I have a question that might apply to all three bills. Um, Yes. I just want to check 879. Um, um, These types of, uh, of, this type of legislation historically has been um, specifically limited to the initial prescription. Um, And I know that in at least one of these, it's it's left to DOH to determine that kind of guidance. Is there an issue with putting that language, that type of language in the bill, rather than leaving it to Department of Health to make that um, articulation or regulation? I think, you know, I would prefer that the Department of Health in close uh, collaboration with the boards of medicine and boards of pharmacy to make that determination. Um, if you and the committee members decide that that should be kept in the statute, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. Okay. Thank you. Go right ahead then. I think. Um, and the last, thank you very much. Uh, the last bill is uh, Senate Bill uh, 879 on the administration of medications. This is adding two words to the current Pharmacy Practice Act to allow pharmacists to administer medications. Um, it's uh, rather a conundrum that pharmacists have given tens of thousands of COVID vaccines alone in the last few months by intramuscular injection, yet uh, other medications of public health importance, one related to COVID, such as antibody treatment, or in a personal anecdote, my uh, nine-year-old daughter, we thought she had strep on a Sunday. Um, it would have been nice to be able to have her go and, under current law, get a strep test, and if it was positive, to be administered a penicillin shot in the pharmacy in the same fashion that pharmacists give vaccines. Um, you know, it's something that I thought of in preparing testimony for this bill, that that is available in up to 40 other states, not ours, many of our neighboring states, it's really just correcting the practice of pharmacy and maintaining a provider-pharmacist uh, relationship um, uh, that uh, prescriptions can be filled um, for, by pharmacists administering the medication. 
and I'll take any questions. So this bill is different in that it's dis it's dispensing rather it's dispensing. than pres rather than prescribing. Correct. Okay. I importantly, pharmacists working under collaborative practice agreements could, uh, which are partnerships with uh, uh, currently only physicians, um, if a physician in a collaborative practice agreement, for example, to manage uh, strep throat, uh, they could administer medications through that or um, or other medications. Okay. But right now they can't. So there's not a there's not a prescribing component to this. I'm going through it as correct. we speak to make to double check that. But okay, that is correct. Okay. Questions from the committee on this testimony on those three bills? Thank you. All right, thank you. Yep. Next, we have Matthew LaCroix to try to connect with on um, Senate Bill 488. Mr. LaCroix? Hi, Senator Miller. Hi, I believe you're also signed up on 490, so you can go ahead on both of those. Perfect. Um, and, I, and I am on the E79 too, so do you want me to do all yes. three? Yes, you can. Perfect, thank you. Um, on behalf of the Rhode Island Pharmacist Association, I speak in support of Bill 488, which is for oral contraceptives. Senator Anderson did a great introduction, and I Thank you to hear Dr. Uh, Jeff Bratberg's presentation. Um, but the biggest thing I wanted to add in, um, and hopefully I'm not repeating myself, is that patients who usually use pharmacies when they look at the other 14 states that have this are patients who don't have primary care or don't have regular access to primary care. So this is not fragmenting healthcare at all. This is bringing people back into the primary care fold and re uh, reconnecting them to healthcare. Um, and it does ultimately, looking at the data from Oregon, save the state money through the state Medicaid program and avoiding unwanted pregnancies. Um, so that's 488. Is there any questions? Any questions from the committee? Go right ahead. Sure. For 490, this is a much more generalized bill. 488 is a very specific, looking at one particular opportunity for it. 90 says instead of coming to the legislature every time we have a specific disease state to ha have this authority, we would work with the Department of Health um, as the overseer to create these protocols between the Board of Medicine and the Board of Pharmacy to allow these to be created in a more spontaneous, uh, not spontaneous isn't the right word, but in a deliberate practice way without having to go through the legislature each time. There's very specific circumstances laid out in the bill um, that would the protocol would have to meet to be allowed to be enacted under this bill. Um, and things are very much self-limiting or um, things that pharmacists already have authority to do. So a pharmacist can already do a CLIA wave test at the pharmacy. I can actually already do a strep, uh, strep test in the pharmacy because it's a CLIA wave test. However, I can't actually go to the next step and follow a protocol and give you the medication. I would have to refer you to a physician or prescriber then to get the prescription back. So it's kind of looking at those things that are already within the Pharmacy Practice Act here in Rhode Island and being able to follow them up um, under a limited a limited scope of prescribing. But that would already always be seen, overseen by the Department of Medicine or Department of Health in conjunction with the Board of Pharmacy and the Board of Medicine. Uh, so any questions for 490? Any questions on 490 before he goes to um, the next bill? Go right ahead. Sure, thank you. For Bill 879, which is the um, administration of medications, this is continuing the partnership between medicine and pharmacy in which the physician is, has to provide a prescription for the pharmacist to be able to administer it. We know pharmacists can give IM and sub-Q injections. Pharmacists have given hundreds of thousands of IM injections in the state of Rhode Island over the past year with COVID. Um, this is something we're already trained to do. This just widens the scope of medications that pharmacists could potentially give, increasing access to public who may not be able to work, be in daytime hours. And in particular, looking at substance use disorder medications and anti-psychotic, long-acting antipsychotics, there would ultimately be a long-term save cost savings for the state Medicaid programs with better adherence. 
Uh, any questions? Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Croy from the committee? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Miller. Okay. I think next we're going to move on to uh, Senate Bill 489, and uh, we have Brad Shear calling in. Mr. Shear, you're calling in on Senator Coyne's uh, 489, I believe. Yes. Uh, hello. This is Brad Shear. I am the CEO of the Potter League for Animals um, in Middletown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for uh, letting me talk to you today. Uh, I am testifying in favor of Senate Bill 489, which would allow veterinarians to donate uh, medication to organizations like ours. Uh, the Potter League operates the state's largest animal shelter in Middletown. In addition, uh, we also operate the, the state's largest spay and neuter clinic in Warwick and uh, our only full-service uh, nonprofit veterinary clinic in Riverside. Uh, and at that clinic, we only serve the pets of people who receive public assistance. Uh, so our, our need for veterinary care, both for homeless animals and for animals uh, belonging to people for whom uh, typical veterinary care is financially out of reach uh, is extensive. Uh, and, and we're happy to and able to provide veterinary care to those animals because we have a very generous community in Rhode Island that's caring when it comes to pets. And uh, you know, part of that generous community is veterinarians, uh, and unfortunately, uh, veterinarians can't fully participate uh, in supporting the work that we do because of limits placed upon them uh, when it comes to donating medication they have and, and are forced to simply dispose of. Um, so my hope is that you will support Senate Bill 49 and its passage so that uh, animals, both homeless animals, the Potter League, and, and animals belonging to people who can't otherwise afford medication uh, will be helped. And uh, thank you for your time. I've submitted written testimony as well, and so I won't go into more detail than that. Any questions for Mr. Shear? I want to thank you for calling in. Um, I think the next caller we have is also on this bill, Gary Block. Thank you. Mr. Block, do you want to go ahead with your testimony? Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. Yep. Um, dear members of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you in support of S-489. Even though you can't see this, uh, sitting next to me at my desk here at work is a box filled with thousands of dollars of veterinary medications that have been turned over to my hospital by pet owners as a result of their pets no longer needing them or their pets having unacceptable side effects or their pets passing away. And as currently is the case, I am required to classify all of these medicines as medical waste and throw them in the trash. Many of these medicines have never even been opened. Veterinarians are not now legally allowed to give these medications away, even if free. As you probably heard or know already, one of the biggest challenges facing shelters, pounds, and nonprofit veterinary hospitals is the cost associated with treating sick and injured patients in their care. Many pet owners who utilize the services at facilities such as the Pets in Need Clinic and the Providence Animal Rescue League and the Rhode Island SPCA are unable to afford the medication costs associated with their pet's illness. This may include drugs such as insulin, antibiotics, pain relievers, and anti-seizure medications, to name just a few. This bill aims to help defray some of these costs by repurposing these perfectly usable and effective medicines for animals in need and pet owners with financial limitations. This bill would also allow shelters, pounds, and rescue organizations with often bare-bones budgets to have access to these medicines for pets they're trying to get healthy and adopted to the public or organizations such as the Rhode Island Wildlife Rehabilitators Association to get injured wildlife back into the wild. Keeping these medications out of medical waste facilities in our landfills is another obvious benefit of supporting the passage of this legislation. 
This bill would also allow for medications that are recently expired to be donated as long as the donating and prescribing veterinarians have no reason to suspect the loss of potency. Medicine still in blister packs and in unopened bottles would be particularly useful in this regard. Since some of these medications can cost thousands of dollars a year, the benefits of making them available to animals in need, despite being just outside their expiration date, clearly outweighs the potential and unlikely loss of efficacy. The bill as written would, for obvious reasons, forbid the transfer of medicines that are considered controlled substances and forbids donations of drugs requiring refrigeration. The bill also provides immunity for veterinary hospitals donating these medications to a nonprofit organization for any adverse drug reactions. In every case where one of these donated medications would be utilized, a licensed Rhode Island veterinarian would be responsible for determining the appropriateness of it being used or dispensed. Thank you for your time and for considering support of this legislation. I would be happy to answer any questions anyone has at this time. Are there any logistical complications with exchanging drugs from one hospital or or veterinarian to another? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. So the bill as it's written requires any identifying information for the owner and the prior pet to be blacked out or removed from the medications. The bill also requires the receiving hospital to keep these medications separated from their other supply of medications. And thirdly, the bill requires the uh, client, pet owner, to be informed that these medications are turnover medications from another hospital. So logistically, I hope those things have been addressed in the bill. Um, the other thing that the, the bill would allow is since all of these nonprofit veterinary facilities um, are in close communication with each other, they would be allowed to share these medications amongst each other. So if nonprofit A had a dog that needed a seizure medicine and nonprofit B happens to have that in their turnover stash, they could potentially utilize that medicine in that way. So some of it logistically may be more of a transporting medications from one place to another. But for example, like I said, in my hospital, which is admittedly, you know, the largest in the state, um, I get thousands of dollars of medications every month or two, and I up until up until hopefully this bill passes, what I've been doing is probably skirting the law. I just didn't have the heart to throw these medicines out. So there are nonprofit organizations in the Caribbean that I would box up these medicines to and, and ship them down there since it's illegal to use them in Rhode Island and in the United States, other than one other state in, in the United States, um, because like I said, these medicines were perfectly usable. So it's definitely something that that will have to be a little bit of a work in progress as far as how the medicines are transferred. But the bill, I think, addresses any issues of privacy and appropriateness of use as it's currently written. Do you mind disclosing which veterinary hospital you work with? Oh, not at all. Ocean State Veterinary Specialist. I imagine once you said largest that that's who you were talking about. Um, yeah. I do I mean, have a very close friend yeah. that worked there for quite a while. She very much enjoyed it as a veterinarian. Oh. I think it was oh, well, her that, thank you. second, I appreciate second the, professional um, position after she moved from Washington State here. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, we have 50 doctors here, so obviously the number of medications that get turned over to us yeah. are going to be yeah. larger, but but yeah. there's still every single vet in the state, I'm sure, has medication that yeah. they know they could utilize in this way. Yeah. It has a national reputation that re that actually attracted her from the other coast. So. Oh, well, that's yeah. very sweet. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions I can answer? I know you guys are super busy. Any other questions from the committee? Thank you for calling in. All right. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Next, I think we have one caller for uh, Bill 589, uh, Senator Valverde's. I believe Anita Jacobson wants to speak on Senator Valverde's 589. Go right ahead. 
Thank you, Chairman Miller and members of the committee, and thank you, Senator Valverde, for introducing this legislation. I am a pharmacist in Rhode Island, uh, but I'm addressing you tonight as a former cigarette smoker. I started smoking when I was about 14 years old. It was just occasional dabbling until about the age of 16 when I became a more regular smoker. And by college, I was smoking up to a pack a day and was very addicted to nicotine. I really wanted desperately to quit smoking in pharmacy school. It was definitely frowned upon by faculty and my fellow students, and I was extremely ashamed of my addiction. But by the end of class every day, I was suffering so much from withdrawal symptoms I would race to my car, often turning down opportunities to socialize or participate in activities because I wanted to smoke so badly and I was willing to sacrifice those experiences. The reason this is relevant to this legislation is that I never told my primary care doctor that I smoked, and more importantly, he never asked. He was also my parents' doctor, and we are, quote, an educated family, so I'm quite certain he just assumed that I was smart enough, you know, not to start smoking. I suffered greatly from withdrawal every time I tried to quit, which was upwards of 10 to 20 times during college. The truth is that if I could have gone to a pharmacist, particularly in a town where no one knew me and far away from my parents to get a prescription, I'm 100% sure I would have. As a college student, I often didn't have the money up front to buy patches or gum over the counter. And when I did, it wasn't really what I wanted to spend my money on because I was young and short-sighted. Um, to this day, when I go to the doctor, it's very rare for someone to ask me if I ever smoked, you know, as a pharmacy professor. It's just they make the assumption uh, that, you know, it's not something that I would do. So the reality is that sometimes physicians don't know uh, the smoking status of their patients. And I really admire my colleagues in primary and specialty care, and I suspect that they um, work hard to have an open-ended uh, dialogue with their patients, but the access that pharmacists have um, to people and the 24-7 availability, all pharmacists are trained in tobacco cessation therapy. I've personally taught every single one of them that walks across that stage at URI since 2010, and we do intensive simulations with patients to provide smoking cessation counseling. So I hope you'll consider passing this legislation. I think the pandemic has proven pharmacists are ready, willing, and able to provide care. Um, and this allows us to expand choice for patients and easy 24 access to these low-risk prescriptions for the disease of nicotine addiction. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. So I just have one, I don't know if it's a question, but um, or maybe you encountered this, but... Um, currently, there are several uh, tobacco cessation, cessation therapies that are available over, count, over the counter. Yeah. Um, but it should be understood by those who are interested in those over the counter that there can be a less expensive, it could be less expensive for the patient to actually get them prescribed. Right. Because they're expensive over the counter, and if they're prescribed, um, some of the expense of it will be, co be covered because it's not a prescription drug. And also, the ones that are not over the counter yet, um, it is important, like an 879 has the same uh, motivation, I believe, in that you want to get people as quick as possible and administer them right. as quick as possible or get them the uh, cessation drug or the MAT, which might be covered under 879, as quick as possible. And um, both yeah. of these pieces of legislation facilitate that. Right, especially with, as you know, with the disease of addiction, you know, people sometimes need multiple quit attempts and it might be a, a weekend or a holiday or something that motivates them you know around the new year around the christmas holidays we used to see a lot of people come into the pharmacy wanting to quit and if it's not covered by the insurance without a prescription just that cost they often say oh forget it i'll come back next week 
and then you know they may never come back. Right. Any other questions for the committee? Thank you for calling in. Thank you. So I want to skip to um, Senate Bill 859. And the first person we have signed up on that bill is Stephanie Hengst. Stephanie? Yes, hello. Um, thank you for calling and go ahead with, the, with your testimony. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chairman and committee members. My name is Stephanie Hengst and I'm with the AIDS Institute, which is an organization that is dedicated to protecting healthcare access for people living with HIV, as well as hepatitis. And Bill 859 is going to do just that. It's going to protect access to prescription drugs for HIV patients. So even though with insurance, barriers there are still barriers that exist for HIV treatment. Prescription drugs can still be inaccessible because of high deductibles. For example, in Newport, you know, a silver level plan deductible can run up to 5,700. There's also co-insurance that runs high. And copay accumulator policies are just one more barrier that has been added to the burden for patients. So copay assistance is something that helps patients cover the cost of their out-of-pocket payment. It's not a discount and it's not reducing the price of the drug. It's simply helping the patient afford the drug. And you know this is especially pertinent as more individuals and families are facing financial challenges as a result of the pandemic. Um, one of the direct effects copay accumulator policies have on patients is that when they go to the pharmacy and they are handed that um, high, high bill, they're going to leave empty handed because they can't afford it. And we know this because there is pharmaceutical claims data that shows the correlation between those high co-payments or co-insurance and prescription abandonment rates. So when we're thinking specifically about, um, you know, the 3,000 plus Rhode Islanders that are living with HIV, if these patients abandon their prescriptions or if they're rationing their doses even, that can lead to irreversible disease progression or development of drug resistance. Um, and in particular for HIV, the person could, um, if their virus isn't suppressed, there is a risk of spreading HIV in the community. Um, and so while all of these things are detrimental to the individual's health um, or the public health, it also can contribute to, you know, long-term increased health care costs for the state. Um, and this year, when looking at Rhode Island's health insurance plans on the ACA marketplace, we have seen that the largest health insurer provide, insurance provider in the state has applied a copay accumulator policy to their plans. Um, and Bill 859 is going to ensure that Rhode Island patients are protected from these practices and that they can afford the prescription drugs. And some of the um, opposition arguments that we've heard say that a bill like this is going to drive patients to more expensive drugs. Um, but again, research shows that when there are lower cost drugs available, patients are gonna choose those. So in this case, we're talking about specialty meds that don't have numerous generics available. Um, we've also heard, you know, that a bill like this might cause premiums to rise, but you know, there have been many other states at this point that have passed legislation similar to this, and we haven't seen that be the cause for premium rate changes in those states. So in conclusion, you know, I'm urging you all to think about the patients who have been put between a rock and a hard place in this situation, and by supporting um, 859 is going to ensure that when you're counting okay assistance toward annual cost sharing requirements, patients will be able to get their prescriptions and stay healthy. That's it for me. Thank you. So I don't know if you can answer this question or maybe one of the other callers, but is it in the intent of the legislation to also cover those who are enrolled in Medicaid? Um, I don't believe it extends to Medicaid, but I would definitely request others input, um, in part because Medicaid typically, um, the, the co-pays are lower. Um, it's not as no. big of a deal. Um, and then also there could be restrictions within the Medicaid program, like in Medicare, um, that wouldn't permit um, payments made by, um, through co uh, sorry, co copay assistance to be counted. Okay, any other questions from the committee? 
Thank you for calling in. Thank you. Um, the next call we ex we want to connect with is uh, Richard Pazillo from the New England Hemophilia Association. Mr. Pazillo? Yes. Go right ahead with your testimony on 859. Great, great. Thank you so much, Chairman. Uh, my name is Rich Pazillo. I'm the Executive Director of the New England Hemophilia Association, otherwise known as NEHA. For over six decades, NEHA has assisted and advocated on behalf of patients living with bleeding disorders like hemophilia throughout Rhode Island and the other five New England states. Uh, today, I'm proud to join 22 other patient advocacy groups in support of S859. I'll just give you a little brief background about hemophilia. It's an inherited rare genetic condition that affects about 20,000 people in the United States, um, about 200 people in the state of Rhode Island. People with hemophilia lack the ability to make a blood protein clot um, in the process. Without treatments, people with hemophilia bleed internally and sometimes as a result of trauma, but sometimes it's a result of everyday activities. There is no generic option for hemophilia. The annual cost is about $350,000 a year, and all the treatment is either through intravenous or through sub-Q uh, sub injections. Uh, copay accumulator adjusters are a new cost containment insurance technique that are found, as you know, in roughly 80% of commercial health plans. Uh, accumulators can be hard to spot for hemophilia patients because they're embedded in dense plan documentations with deceptive names such as out-of-pocket protection programs or specialty copay solutions, but their impact for our community is unmistakable. Let's take Chris, for example, who lives in Coventry, Rhode Island, and has hemophilia. Chris orders his treatment through a mail-order specialty pharmacy every month based on his insurance allotment. This means that on January 1st each year, Chris is expected to pay the thousands of dollars up front in order to receive his monthly shipment of this life-saving medication. Thankfully, there is help for people like Chris who struggle with the cost of his hemophilia treatments through patient assistance programs. Health plans claim that accumulators are needed to prevent third-party assistance from artificially inflating drug prices. However, for our community, as I mentioned, there's no generic options and patients do not set the cost of their treatment. Today, again, as I mentioned, I stand with other patient advocacy groups to urge you to pass S85. Nine on behalf of Rhode Islanders living with hemophilia and other types of bleeding disorders. Thank you for thank you again for this opportunity. Any questions from the committee? Um, I don't know if you heard my question that I had addressed to um, Stephanie Hengst over whether uh, it's I the intent of the that. legislation to also have it apply to Medicaid. Okay. Can you just repeat that question? I just, I, had, uh, I just had a hard time of hearing. Is it the intent of the legislation to also have it apply to Medicaid patients? Yeah, it's a great question. I know that um, looking at commercial health plans and, and others is definitely the focus, but I know that um, many on that type of service are not eligible for third-party patient assistance, but I could certainly look into that as well. Yeah, if, if it is the intent, there, there should be some drafting changes. Okay. Yeah. I, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the committee? Thank you for calling in. Okay, great. Thank you, Chairman. Um, next, we'll uh, hear from Corey Chandler from the American Cancer Society Action Network. Hi, Chairman. How are you? Good. Go right ahead. You're on with the committee. Thanks so much. My name is Corey Chandler. I'm the Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network here in Rhode Island. So as many of you already know, ACS can advocate at all levels of government um, for evidence-based policy and legislative solutions designed to eliminate cancer as a major health problem. I just wanted to thank you all for the opportunity to provide testimony on Senate Bill 859 this afternoon. 
This, the purpose of this bill has already been well explained, so I won't belabor that point, but I did just want to acknowledge the importance of this legislation for cancer patients. So we all know that patients in general are facing increasing health care costs. So according to a report by, by the um, Kaiser Family Foundation, annual deductibles have increased 25% over the past five years. As these deductibles increase and become more common, the share of people with over $2,000 in annual out-of-pocket spending has increased from 4% to 12% in the last 15 years. And it's no secret that many cancer patients already have difficulty affording the cost of their prescription drugs, regardless of whether, whether or not they're insured. And the pandemic has actually exasperated this hardship for many chronically ill patients. According to a uh, recent national survey that ACSCAN conducted um, that included cancer patients and caregivers, 87% of respondents said that the pandemic had affected their cancer care in some manner, and 46% said that it had impacted their financial situation and their ability to pay for care in some way. So that would include medications as well. And we know as out-of-pocket costs continue to escalate for cancer patients and uh, cancer survivors for prescription drugs and other services, these patient assistance programs have quite literally become a lifesaver for individuals and families at every income level. Many of these programs actually exist for drugs without generic or therapeutic, therapeutically equivalent alternatives, as others have previ previously stated. New br We're so lucky that new breakthroughs in cancer research are making more life-saving drug therapies available to cancer patients and survivors. And, but these drugs, they really can't make a difference in the lives of Rhode Islanders if they're not affordable. So keeping these therapies affordable for patients is truly imperative, and that's what patient assistant programs are designed to do. For this reason, reason I urge you to support um, S859, which would, as others have stated, ensure that the value of copay support and our coupons would count towards an individual's out-of-pocket costs. Thanks so much. I'm happy to take any questions you have. I don't know if you heard my previous question. I gave the last two per people who called in about um, the intent of the legislation. Is it is the intent to also cover me Medicaid patients? I, I actually don't know the answer, but from looking at the legislation, it appears that it does not do that. It's, but is it the intent for it to, or would you prefer it to? Um, I, I unfortunately don't have the answer to that. I'm happy to get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Are there yeah, que sure. questions from others in the committee? For Corey? Thank you for calling in. Thanks. I think the last person on this bill is Bill Murphy from the Epilepsy Foundation of New England. Mr. Murphy, you're on with the committee. Go right ahead. Thank you, Chairman Miller and members of the committee. I'm Bill Murphy, Director of Advocacy and Public Policy for Epilepsy Foundation New England. Um, you know, it was noted in an earlier hearing that I was calling in on a 617 area code number. Uh, that's the work number. I want to assure everyone I'm a Rhode Island resident living in, on and loving a Quidnick Island. But I submitted my testimony to the committee, and the previous callers did a great job making key points. So I won't read that in its entirety, but simply make a few highlights. Um, one in 26 Americans will develop epilepsy at some point in their life. And on behalf of the more than 11,100 individuals living with epilepsy in Rhode Island, we urge your support for Senate Bill 859. For most people living with epilepsy, anti-epileptic drugs are by far the most common and cost-effective treatment for controlling and reducing seizure. This bill will help to make sure that all payments made for uh, or by an individual count towards their deductibles and out-of-pocket requirements. Everyone is well aware of the rising cost of health care and access to medications, and patients should not be punished for needing or relying upon copay assistance. And insurers should not be allowed to double dip, collecting payment assistance plus the patient's full deductible and out of pocket monies. While epilepsy can affect anyone at any time, it's most common in the very young and older Americans. In fact, the highest instance of new cases is now occurring in older Americans. 
a group greatly impacted by the pandemic and one who can ill afford additional costs. Many people living with chronic conditions such as epilepsy rely upon these copay assistance programs to help cover the costs of what can often be very expensive medications. Even we here at the foundation, we have a medication assistance program to help individuals cover the costs of their epilepsy medications. During the pandemic, we've seen a great increase in the number of requests and in turn have increased the funds allocated to help folks. The need is real. They simply can't afford their medications. With financial uncertainty facing many of them, placing additional constraints on their ability to pay or to have coverage delayed is, for their medications is simply wrong. Um, insurers have instituted copay assistance programs as a result of unfounded concerns that copay reimbursements by prescription drug manufacturers instead of incentivize patients or uh, physicians to prescribe more expensive drugs. And I think the other callers did a great job pointing out that that really is not the case. Um, epilepsy medications, like many others, are not interchangeable. Uh, in addition, many people with epilepsy, especially those with rare epilepsy syndromes, are on several meds for their seizures and accompanying comorbidities. Needing several high-cost medications can have an unbearable cumulative financial effect for these folks without the assistance. Patients shouldn't be denied this assistance or be punished for relying upon the help to cover the cost. Only the insurance companies will benefit and see a savings, not the patient. We strongly urge you to support Senate Bill 859. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, questions. Any questions for Mr. Murphy from the committee? I want to thank you for calling in. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. I believe all the remaining calls to come in, uh, scheduled to be heard, are on Senator Valverde's 830. Um, before we get to those, I think there are the, uh, we had a request to have Senator, um, uh, Dr. McIntyre go first, if we can get her on the line first. Yep. Dr. McIntyre? Yes. Um, you'll be the first person to testify on Senator Valverde's 830. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, Chairman Miller, Chairwoman Valverde, and distinguished members of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee. I am testifying in favor and in support of S830 uh, because it affects the health of Rhode Islanders. This bill costs zero dollars and keeps the same practices that we've had for years, but also helps uh, patients keep their physicians, and it also helps uh, keep Rhode Island physicians practicing in Rhode Island. S830 aims to implement two common sense simple measures by codifying our current practices. It ensures that an unregulated private billion dollar trademark product called maintenance of certification or continued certification does not become required for licensure or insurance panels. Of the approximately 4,500 Rhode Island physicians, 25% would be unable to take care of their approximately 500,000 Dr. patients. Dr. Backentier, I, I don't yeah. want to interrupt you, but we do have enough time for you to slow down a little bit. Oh, okay, sure. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate that. Of the approximately 4,500 Rhode Island physicians, 25% uh, would be unable to take care of their approximately 500,000 patients if MOC became required for licensure or insurance panels. This bill ensures that those 500,000 patients will not lose access to their doctors because of aggressive private monopolies. The main question that we have is do we want doctors practicing in Rhode Island or not? Rhode Island is ranked 50th to practice medicine. We have the lowest reimbursement rates in New England and some of the highest taxes. Psychiatrists are not reimbursed at the rates that other physicians are reimbursed at, and the doctors that stay here stay here because we care about Rhode Island. During the pandemic, it has become obvious that Rhode Island doctors care about you and your loved ones, and we have risked our lives and our families' lives to care for you and your loved ones and your constituents, and all we are asking for you is to make sure that private monopolies 
don't make it harder to practice medicine or harder to care for you and you and those that you care about. S830 protects a physician's right to treat and a patient's right to their physician during a time of severe physician shortage, both in Rhode Island and nationwide. This is a compromise bill that is approved by the Rhode Island Medical Society supporting physicians, hospitals, and patients. A more comprehensive version of this bill had passed in the past. Um, it was based on uh, this is based on the AMA model bill. I have been practicing in Rhode Island for 24 years. I'm a graduate of Brown Residency Program. I've been board certified twice and the former chief of psychiatry at Kent. I am the president of Rhode Island Physicians for Quality Care, representing the opinion of 607 Rhode Island physicians who have signed a petition requesting your help to make sure that we can continue to practice and ensuring that private monopolies trademark products are not are as voluntary as advertised and that those trademark products do not get tied to licensure or insurance panels. The question is, how much do we need your physician? There is a physician shortage, as you know. It's hard to get an appointment with your doctor, and I have trouble getting an appointment with my doctor, and I am a doctor. You have likely noticed that a lot of bills that cross your desks, including many of those tonight, are asking to expand practices of healthcare-related persons because of physician shortages. I would argue that the private non-regulated company, the American Board of Medical Specialties, the AVMS, worth a billion dollars, is making that physician shortage worse in Rhode Island for nothing less than a billion dollars. This private uh, company's trademark product is worsening physician burnout. Their unproven program is keeping thousands of physicians nationwide from taking care of their patients and worsening the physician shortage for no good scientific reason. If you can't get an appointment for you or your loved ones, be sure to ask the AVMS lobbyist who gets paid over $400,000 per year to fly down to Rhode Island, as they have done in the past, and ask them if they care that over 30% of cardiologists with 30 years of education are considering quitting because of their trademark program, or that over 40% of psychiatrists have quit their program because of ridiculous requirements, or that 85% of physicians surveyed by the company itself find their trademark program not valuable. When we have an opioid epidemic, a suicide epidemic, a mental health crisis, and Rhode Island physicians and patients have trouble accessing a psychiatrist, we have a problem, and the ABMS has made it worse. Imagine having to take your high school exams and university exams every year and that the private ABMS could create any multiple choice test that they wanted for you to keep your degree or your job for up to $4,000 per exam. You can take a multiple choice test on driving a big rig or even piloting a spaceship, but it has nothing to do with how good of an astronaut you are. Retaking your final exams in high school has nothing to do with your current job, nor should it. The ABMS has some has had some racially discriminatory practices in the past, and currently they are perpetuating institutional racism and gender discrimination. They have, quote, grandfathered older, more white male physicians from a ridiculous requirement and have discriminated against women and minorities as they are required to pay thousands more to work in the same job and are kept from practicing based on arbitrary requirements that older, mostly white male physicians are not required to do. It is discriminatory behavior by creating an elite class and giving them competitive advantages for no scientific reason. It's similar to the poll tax or literacy tax required to vote in the past in the South. Ultimately, the private company is worsening patients' access to physician. Their trademark products have no practical value. But you don't have to take my word for it. Ask your own doctor or 85% of the patients or the physicians surveyed by the private company itself or ask any of the over 600 Rhode Island physicians who have signed this petition. Physicians know that the AVMS supposedly, quote, voluntary program, end quote, has essentially become required in some settings. They are trying to link their trademark product to licensure and have linked it to insurance panels in some states. If it becomes required, like they intend it to be for licensure through the National License Initiative or in Michigan for insurance panels, then over 25% of physicians, as mentioned, would be unable to treat their patients. At least 500,000, as I mentioned, patients would have no doctor in Rhode Island. So the question again is, how much do you need your physician? You can argue that those with less years training would be okay to see, but when you need the highest level of care possible for your particular illness or your particular problem, you want to see somebody who has the most training, and physicians have the most training by design. Over 600 Rhode Island physicians are asking for your help, and more than 25% of physicians could be affected. Don't let private out-of-state monopolies make the physician shortage 
in Rhode Island any worse than it is. If you are considering granting those with no medical school or residency training an expanded ability to treat patients versus physicians with 24 to 30 years of education, then at least also help the doctors that have stood with you through the worst pandemic we have had in our lifetime. In summary, this book, this bill costs zero dollars and saves taxpayers money. It codifies current practices, making sure that private monopolies did not get tied to licensure or insurance panels. It improves patient access to health care by keeping physicians practicing in Rhode Island. It attracts quality doctors looking to focus on patient care. It reduces unnecessary spending in health care that does not improve patient outcomes. It gives patients more time with their doctors who will have more time for patient care. It gives physicians the flexibility to recertify with other companies. It reduces institutional racial and gender discrimination against younger doctor, doctors, including more women and minorities. It ensures Rhode Island taxpayers aren't sent uh, dollars aren't sent to out-of-state monopolies to pay millions of dollars for the CEO's salaries. It ensures fairness for all Rhode Island doctors, not just those benefiting from the ABMS's moneyed interest. And it will help pa patients continue to have access to their physician. I, I urge you to vote in favor of S830 if you care about Rhode Island and the physicians who are also caring for you and your constituents. Thank you very much for letting us talk and having this hearing so that we can talk about this very important legislation. So as a committee member, um, I got one of the several dozen emails that all started off with the same sentence around this legislation that were sent to us. And I want to read you the sentence, and then I'll ask you the question that concerns me about this. It's, okay. I, I think every one of these letters, emails, starts off with the same sentence. It is more crucial than ever to make sure that patients have access to physicians of their choice. So while you were talking, I'm a Blue Cross enrollee, and I searched for a psychiatrist, knowing that you were testifying, so I thought I'd use you as, as a starting point for this. And so I searched. Um, it's very easy to search on their website for doctors within their plan that I can access. And there were actually um, more doctors, psychiatrists, than I imagined. Um, there are 652. And I scrolled through as many as I could while you were speaking. And at no point that I can see is there any indication for a patient who is choosing to know whether you are certified or not, board certified or not. So how does certification play into a patient choosing a physician So uh, that's a very good question, and I think that, that it's an important to look at it in, in the broader scheme of what's happening nationwide. So in some states, like Rhode Island, it's not yet tied to, to licensure, and it's not yet tied to insurance panels. But what we do know is that in some states, like Michigan, they had to pass a law specifically making sure that pediatricians, psychiatrists, and internal medicine physicians were not affected by this private company, the ABMS, in order for them to continue to take Blue Cross, specifically, and be able to continue to treat their patients. So I think at the moment it's state dependent, but we know, again, that this is a private monopoly, and this private monopoly is really yeah, trying as but hard that, as they can. What I'm getting at is the crux of the email, which all of us got several dozen of, that all started out with that sentence that I read that this is a physician of their choice issue. And first of all, if, if, we're, if we're supposed to take that as it's written, and I'm supposed to go choose a physician based on whether they're board certified or not, there is no currently designation on whether they're certified or not. So how are we choosing based on certification if it's not indicated? I, I think that, that maybe the statement that maybe we're misinterpreting the, the statement or the statement is not intended as, as you're interpreting it. 
So I think that it, the statement that you are probably interpreting is that if if this private company does what they would like to do, which is tie themselves to licensure and insurance panels, which they have done in some states, um, then it would make it harder for a physician who is not board certified by this private company to be able to have to be able to stay on insurance panels. And so we are only this is proactive, proactive legislation to make sure that it doesn't happen based on what's happening in other states. It's it, but does the letter, legis, legislation motive, motivate or, or would it be your ultimate goal to have it indicate whether a physician was board certified or not? So a patient no, for, could, for my, so a patient could choose between somebody who is board certified and somebody who is not. So from my perspective, and and the physicians who are um, you know affected by this private company, the, the 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 point of whether they are board certified is really like a housekeeping seal. It doesn't guarantee that it's better. It doesn't guarantee that a physician is better. You can look up any physician if you want, and is my physician board certified? There's a website through this private company to see if they've been board certified by this particular company. But my goal is is to make sure that that doesn't affect a, a patient's ability to see their physician. That an insurance company can't say that you can't work on my panel, you can't see our patients because you didn't buy the module this month. Because that's what's happening in Michigan and that's what happened to pediatricians who are trying to see their patients. And I want to make sure that, because I, I don't believe that this, this housekeeping seal is, is valuable anymore. I really think that it's, it's just a, a ploy to try to keep money coming into their pockets. And they changed the board certification from a once in a lifetime and they've let many older physicians who are mostly white male keep that older distinction that they can be board certified for life. But all the other younger physicians who include more minorities and women have had to have their board certification process change every year. And so now it was 10 years and now it's one year for some doctors and for anesthesiologists. You have to fill out something every month. You have to buy something every month in order to keep practicing. So the distinction at this point is not valuable to me. It's whether they may have been board certified initially because that's sort of, you know, like passing your final exams. But to keep taking an arbitrary exam every month, you know, to be able to continue to practice medicine is not a valuable distinction anymore. I don't want that to become something that is important or required okay. for insurance. So, so just in to that case, kind of get to the there. bottom of this so we can move on to the other people who want to speak on this. If this is preemptive. Right now it's not um, indicated whether somebody is board certified and it would be impossible without talking directly to the physician to know that. You, you can look it up on, on the website if you want to, but what I'm trying to say yeah. is that you know, in some in in, Mich in Michigan, they kicked off doctors off of their board, off of their panel, who didn't buy the module that month and pay their fee to this private company that month. Okay. Are there other questions for Dr. McIntyre from the committee? Senator Valverde. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Doctor. Um, could you describe kind of what the um, the current process is for the maintenance of certification? Kind of like what you what you actually have to do every year. Um, so it it really depends on each specialty, and and depending on you know your specialty, you might find that it's more onerous or not. And one of the problems is that they change it every single year. So every single year, you're jumping through bunches of hoops. You might have to buy it. One year, they had they made a, people buy a hand washing module, um, and you had to pay you know a few hundred dollars to buy a hand washing module. The next year, they make you take a test, and the next year they they say, oh well, we're not going to do tests anymore. You took your test, but that's okay. We you know just give us your two thousand dollars, and then we want you to take a quiz, and then we want you to read an article, and then take a quiz, and then we want you to make sure that you do self-assessment things, but you can only buy self-assessment programs from our particular partner, this particular program, and 
for for me, for example, I you know we do continuing medical education. Continuing medical education is required uh, for licensure, and we love continuing medical education. We've been to school for a long time. We like going to school. It's kind of one of our fun things to do. What we don't like is somebody telling us, you know, you need to study, you know, space module X on psychiatry on in CL, you know, in, in North Korea when that has nothing to do with my ability to practice medicine or it has nothing to do with my current practice. But this particular co- program and this particular company ask you to take modules from whatever they decide or whoever they're connected with or whatever company they're connected with, and, and they're only those are allowed for you to do. For internal medicine physicians, they made them do these surveys. So they had to, you know, send an 80-question survey to their patients. They had to do all the data entry for themselves. The data entry went to the private company itself. The private company did whatever they did with their private data company. They they do with data data company. It takes hours and hours and hours of individual things. It's really busy work. And then at the end of it, all the physicians did it, and then the company said, oh, well, that doesn't matter anymore. We're going to do something else instead in order for you to keep your license. I mean, in order for you to keep your, quote, board certification, they make you do something else and something else and something else. So for me, for example, um, I had to take a, a test. And I'm working there with physicians who have are board certified out for life. So they didn't have a clue what I was doing. I had had a baby. And, and I was told that if I didn't take that test that month, that I was not going to be able to practice at that particular hospital. And I, I said, well, I just had a baby. <laughs> can, can I do it? you know, at the end of my certification process and, and, and then give me a three-month waiver, and they said no. And so luckily the other hospital I was working with said, yeah, no, it's no big deal. You know, it's not, it's not that important. Nobody uh, even has any indication that those who are doing it are not better than those who are not doing it, which is why we have all these doctors who have never been board certified and or have been board certified once. So I've been board certified twice, but that doesn't make me a better doctor than those who've been grandfathered out, and they're not better than I am because there is no proof that anybody buying these modules or taking these little quizzes or you know doing these surveys are better than those who are not. But what we do know is that it is so onerous for doctors that they're considering quitting. And one of the doctors who couldn't testify tonight, um, who would have testified, Dr. Levine, who's you know head of cardiology for Rhode Island, said. You know, they surveyed their cardiologists nationwide, and 30% are considering quitting medicine because of these onerous programs. So from my perspective, it's kind of like having to take your final exams in high school or, or medical school or graduate school or, or university again and again and again. It has nothing to do with what you're doing in your practice or it has nothing to do with what you're doing in your job. But if you don't do it, if you don't pay the money and take that test again on that particular subject matter that they tell you to do, um, then then you then you are not allowed to practice in certain settings. And what we're trying to do, and what at least 15 other states have done, is make sure that physicians are not being tied to these private companies that have no scientific value in in their testing or their modules that they keep changing every year. Because if it were really valuable, they would make everybody do it. But but physicians have been board certified 30 years ago have never had to do it again and again and again. But they're still like the chief of their you know of their program or their whatever, and 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 they're continuing to practice along with the rest of us who have to pay thousands more per year. And those who are affected tend to be more minorities, women, who are affected because at the time that they grandfathered out these physicians, they were mostly white men. So now, unfortunately, we're having to continue to do these modules working alongside somebody who doesn't even have a clue what we're doing. And we're having to buy all these things, and it's it's causing a significant amount of burnout for physicians, and for no good reason. I mean, if we thought it was valuable, it would be great. I took a review course on internal medicine at uh, Harvard, but at that time they were not partners with the AVMS. So in spite of the fact that I'm going to world-renowned training and getting world-renowned continuing medical education that counts for my license, um, it didn't count for my board certification nonsense that I had to do that they told me that I had to buy it from a different company, and that was not going to be Harvard at that time. So it, it's completely arbitrary, and if you look at the at the, some of the documents that I included, you know, when people are earning a million dollars a year and they're sending down their, their, their liaisons that earn $400,000 a year, and for my specialty um, in psychiatry, our, the CEO of that company earns $3 million a year, and they just built a, you know, a $60 million, you know, 
a world-renowned architectural design building around a lake, and, and they have more money than they know what to do with. They have more money than, than I mean, even if they gave $10 million to each person in their company, um, they would have more money than they knew what to do with. It's all about money at this point. This maintenance of certification is all about money-making, and, and what it is doing, though, it is affecting our ability to practice medicine. It is Dr. burning McIntyre, out Dr. McIntyre, if I could interrupt you, I just want to be able to sure. have... Um, well, there's another committee coming in at 5 o'clock, and we have some, uh, some other business to do, and we have a few other people signed up on this bill. Sure, of course. Okay. Uh, Senator Bell, I believe, has a question. I, I do. Just, just, just very briefly, uh, Doctor, would you think it's fair to, to characterize the current system as essentially uh, privatization of... Uh, public health uh, and medical uh, uh, licensing decisions? So that's what they're trying. To, I, I think that that's a fair question. I think that that's their goal. I think they're trying to privatize it, um, and, and we're trying to make sure that it stays in, in the state's hands, that it stays uh, within the legislature of Rhode Island and within the Department of Health of Rhode Island, and it doesn't get privatized by these private companies. That's our goal. Thank you so much. But is it also fair to say that a physician stays licensed whether or not they're board certified? So at this time, um, it is not required for licensure in Rhode Island. But through this okay. new compact that people are trying to pass, it, they're trying to tie this particular company to licensure. So we so, know that their goal has been but to that's, do that. That's speculative. Right now, no, it has no, no impact it, 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 on your licensure. It, it, we know that it that they have been trying to do that. Yeah. Um, so that's what we know. Okay. Thank you. I want to move on to the next person to testify, which is Dr. Glenn Fort. You know, Dr. Fort. Hi, good afternoon. This is Dr. Glenn Fort. Go right ahead um, with your medical officer. Go right ahead with your testimony. So, um, yes, yeah, so hi, my name is Dr. Glenn Fort. I'm the chief medical officer at Landmark Medical Center, and for several years now our medical staff has been actively involved in trying to change the law about how physicians uh, have maintenance of certification. A lot of us realize that the way it was done currently was biased and uh, was more of a monopoly through the American Board of Internal Medicine Specialties. So what we've asked is that the state change the law so that it's, it's not a burden on physicians in order to maintain certification and it shouldn't be a requirement that they maintain certification through one organization only, that there be an option. And there are several options available for maintenance of certification and maintenance of board certification as well. And that's where we would like to make sure that it's codified in law in Rhode Island and that it can't be used against physicians uh, in terms of uh, insurance panels and, uh, and uh, medical staff privileges. So to my question where we left off, right now it does not affect your licensure, whether you're certified or not. If, if I don't maintain my certification through the National Board of American, through the American Board of Medical Specialties, it could affect my license in, at being certified in a hospital. So I, make, I may not be able to practice medicine in a hospital if I don't maintain my certification through this particular board. So that's for that specific hospital, but you still are, um, your licensure is not impacted. No, but each hospital has its own requirements about how you maintain uh, privileges at that hospital. Okay. And hospitals could require you to have a certification through one particular national board that may be unfair if there are other boards. So they should, as long as you maintain certification through a board, it shouldn't be just one option, it should be multiple options. Okay. So board certification, you, can you explain uh, how a patient, because like I went through with Dr. McIntyre, the letter talks about physicians of a, patient's, a patient's choice of physician. If a patient was interested 
in understanding a physician's um, continued education, like a lawyer, you can tell by um, it's required by law that they um, continually um, be educated. With a physician, is there a mechanism for a patient to know other than board certification? Yes. They're so, con they're well, the, continuing the state education. of Rhode Island, right? So the state of Rhode Island requires us to re reapply for our medical license every two years, and we have to demonstrate that we have attended a certain amount of courses or, or continuing medical education credits in order to be relicensed by the state of Rhode Island. Yeah. On top of that, there are, if I'm an internist, there is an American Board of Internal Medicine that can also tell me, tell someone that I've recertified through them, and I'm competent. But there are other boards, other than the American Board of Internal Medicine, that could also tell me that I'm still certified because I've attended enough continuing medical education committees that I don't need to have this one particular board's approval. There are alternate boards that can give me an approval. And hospitals have traditionally used the one board because that's the one that was most known. But if there are options, then the hospitals could then tell physicians, you have the option to maintain your board certification through this board or another board, we may require you to have some kind of evaluation through a board, but what we want is that it cannot only be the one board that we are allowed to maintain our certification through. Okay, so a, a patient, because the letter st starts off that we redundantly got, a patient could be confident as long as he still maintains his licensure that he's yes, continuing his separate. education. So, yeah. Correct. In order for us to maintain our license every two years, we have to show competency through a, a certain amount of courses that we have to attend in order to renew our license every two okay. years. Thank you. Are there other questions for Dr. Fort from the committee? Thank you for calling in. Okay, thank you. Dr. Mansour? Yes, hello. Go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for hearing me. My name is Dr. Michael Mansour. I'm a, a nephrologist, a kidney doctor at uh, land, uh, up in Woonsocket area primarily. And um, I am just wanted to, Dr. McIntyre asked me to tell my story because uh, I was a, a former naval officer. I was a physician in the military. I served on the Comfort during the Haiti earthquake. We did, you know, sort of practice medicine um, in a way that hasn't been done in this country under adverse circumstances for, for years. I, uh, a couple of years ago, I took the American Board of Internal Medicine's knowledge check-in. They were a subsidiary of the ABMS. And um, they told me and a few others that we all failed. Um, a month later, they said the preliminary results, those were just preliminary results, and we actually had passed. Um, that underlined some of the arbitrariness and capriciousness of the process and the secretiveness as well. Um, but in the one month in between, I really had a chance to ponder that here I had done dialysis under circumstances not seen in this country by most nephrologists. And there was a group of people sitting in an office building in Philadelphia telling me that I wasn't fit to, you know, call myself a, a, one of the better nephrologists out there. And so I, I offer that to you as, uh, uh, in support of this bill to sort of decrease the importance of um, board certification and maintenance of certification uh, in the practice of medicine in the state. Uh, thank you for hearing me. Any questions? Any questions for Dr. Mansour from the committee? Um, thank you for calling in. Thank you for your time. And sharing your day. story. So I believe that's all the verbal testimony we have on that bill, and I think that's the last bill in which we have calls that um, we were um, 
on our list for those who wish to call in. So at this point, I want to make a motion for, to hold for the following bills. Uh, Senate, Senate Bill 488, 490, 589, 879, 489, 859, 877, and 830. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Well, the, the clerk will take a roll on the whole, whole vote. Senator Miller. Yes. Senator Valverde. Yes. Senator Lawson. Yes. Senator Bell. No. No. Yes. No. Senator Senator Calkin. Senator Mario. Yes. Senator Golden. Yes. Senator Paolino. Yes. So I think that's the business for today. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So all moved. in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you for attending and thank all those who called in or wrote in for doing either. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.